All right, so uh, here we are at uh, the end of the pier. We're going to do some water quality sampling. Since you guys never done this before, we're going to actually go through step by step how to do each one of these tests, and then um, you'll know how to do them. And so next week, then I'll just assign things. I'll say you do this, you do that, and uh, you guys can jump right in and do it. So that's the plan. So just uh, everybody get your data, water quality data sheets out, and we're going to start filling this in. So the location on there is Shoreline Park South in Gulf Breeze, Florida. And um, you've got the date and time. I'm sure you can figure that part out for yourself. Uh, then we need longitude and latitude. And I know there's a number of ways that you can do that. Some of you have phone apps probably that do that. But we have a standalone GPS unit that we're going to use for that today, a handheld GPS. So I'm going to turn that on by pushing the power button and let that come up. Um, the GPS system uses a series of hundreds of geosynchronous satellites that are in orbit and it actually uses a process called trilateration where it measures very precisely the time and the distance from a location. So your handheld thing is the location and then it's measuring the distance from this to that satellite to that satellite to that satellite and then figuring out the differences and timing for all of that to figure out where you're on the surface of the planet. So when this thing comes up, I'm going to push menu and enter. Latitude is north 30 degrees 21.017 minutes. That's uh, north 30 degrees 21.017 minutes. And the uh, la uh, longitude is west 87 degrees 10.517 minutes. That's west 87 degrees. 10.517 minutes. There's different ways to express that. You can do it in hours, minutes, and seconds, or you can do it in digital format. This one reads in digital format. So you know, if you need to convert back and forth, there's websites where you can do that. All right, and after we've got that, we just want to make sure we shut this off. So you hold down the power button for three seconds, and that will shut down the unit. And this one we're using as a Garmin, but you can get all kinds of different handheld units. These are also fun for something called geocaching, which is kind of a, kind of a cool thing. I'm going to Google that if you're interested in it. All right, so now we have that information. Uh, the next thing on our uh, sheet is to determine the percent cloud cover. So the way that meteorologists do that is they look up at the sky and they divide the sky into one eighth. All right, so they call it octets. All right, so uh, one eighth uh, units and they say how much of the sky is completely obscured or covered by clouds and uh, so they measure that in how many eighths so if the whole sky is covered that would be eight eighths so i'm looking around here it looks like we have probably seven eighths today all right and you can convert that into a percentage uh, to get your percent uh, so let's do that very quickly here divided by 8 is 87.5% cloud cover. So I would record that on your sheet then. Next thing we need on the data sheet is the tidal stage. Uh, so the uh, tide was at, uh, high tide was at 7 o'clock this morning and the low tide is going to be around 7.30 uh, tonight. So currently the tidal stage is going out. Uh, we can find out the tidal stage by looking on a tidal chart, uh, and a lot of those are available on the internet. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is water visibility. So for this one, we're going to be using a device. It looks kind of primitive. We've been using these in marine biology for probably 150 years. 
but it actually is pretty good at measuring water visibility. And uh, there's all kinds of high-tech methods that people come up with, but most people still use this as their strategy uh, for wa measuring water visibility. It's called uh, Secidips vis Visibility. And basically, you have this high contrast black and white pattern that's at the end of this uh, rope. And we're going to lower this thing down into the water until it disappears. In other words, you can't see it anymore. And then we're going to bring it up just a little bit until we can see it. And whatever the midpoint is between those two depths, the depth that disappears and the depth that reappears, halfway between those is the Secchi disk visibility depth. And that's measured in meters from the water surface down. All right, so um, this rope is marked off in one meter increments, but we're gonna just uh, measure this with a, a tape measure. And of course, there's two sides to this, English and metric. We're gonna be using the metric side, of course, since this is a science class, we're using the metric. Okay, so I need a volunteer. I'll do it. Great, thanks, come on up. Just to lower that thing down until it disappears. And then, kind of, there's little knots on the rope there. You can kind of look at where that knot is at the water surface when it disappears. And then, when it comes back up, we'll keep an eye on that spot on the rope too. So you can see it's getting a little dim. I don't know, we may hit the bottom before. Is it on the bottom? It is now. Okay. So in cases like that, what you're going to do is just uh, find out what the, look at the knot that's at the water surface, and just keep your eye on that as you pull it up. And when you get it up to the sur uh, up to where you can reach it, put your finger on that spot, just pinch the rope right there. Okay, and we're just going to measure from the secchi disc to the point where you've pinched. And that'll be, uh, we'll say that the visibility is greater than that depth, whatever that is. So this is going to be more than a meter. Can you come help with this? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see, we need the metric size. All right, you can hold that down there at the bottom. Five meters right here and okay you can let go now. measure from where my fingers are to where his fingers are good all right so that's what is that uh, 30 centimeters mm -hmm. Okay, so it was uh, 30 centimeters plus 150, so that's 180 centimeters, or 1.8 meters would be the depth of visibility. Okay, that's all there is to that. And it's, we're writing greater than, so put the greater than symbol in front of that. Can you see that? That bird is called a black skimmer. You see what they do? They drag their lower beak in the water and then they fly back around over the same area and little fish, little minnows will come up to the surface to see what's on the surface. They think there's a bug or something there and then he'll grab the fish. That's the way they feed. It's called a black skimmer. Should be on your species checklist. Oh, look at him. He's... It's amazing how they can do that. So now we're going to use what's called a Kemmermeyer water sampler. This is a sampler that's designed to collect water from a certain depth. Our standard that we're going to use all semester long is to collect water from one meter depth. So there's actually a mark on this rope at the one meter point. If you look carefully, it's a little black mark. And so the way this works is you lower this down until that black mark touches the water surface. And then you're going to drop this little metal piece attached to the rope called the messenger and the messenger will trigger this device to collect the water sample so this is the way it works you drop it so what it captures the water sample 
pull it up to the surface, uh, open up the little nozzle down here by twisting, and then you're going to put the water in this graduated cylinder. Okay, so I need a volunteer that can do this for us. I'll do it. All right, come on over here. And so we have to start this down. So grab a hold of the two suction cups and pull apart until it clicks up here. There it goes. Keep it locked in place. Here's your messenger. It's attached to the rope with the spring, so it should stay attached. So hold that in one hand, and this in the other hand. I'm going to lower it down until that black mark touches the water surface, and then drop this. Try to make sure the rope is good and straight. Get this is turned. You turn that like that. Okay, go ahead and try it. Get up so you can see it looking in the water here. Try to put a little oomph behind it when you drop it this time. Make sure the rope's good and straight. Sometimes the current or the wind will push it and it's not, the rope's not straight, so that makes it harder for it to capture it. Now you got it. Put it over the top of that uh, graduated cylinder and turn the handle. Excellent. That should be a sufficient amount of water. Great. Now you can just pull the ends apart there and let the rest of that water out. Oops, went your toes. Great. All right, that's that. All right, so next we're going to do uh, salinity of the water using this uh, sample from the graduated cylinder that we just got. So we learned how to do this uh, last week, how to use a refractometer to measure salinity. So uh, who remembers how to do that? All right, come on up, and we'll just refresh it just for everybody. But um, go ahead and pour some water into that little container from the graduated cylinder. We don't need a lot, but just maybe half a half full there. Great. All right, this is a brand new disposable uh, eyedropper, so you just peel the paper off that one. Now, you want to get some water in your eyedropper. And remember, we lift the cover, put one or two drops on the blue glass there. Good. Close it. All right, that works. And then you're going to look in this thing, and you're going to see an area that's blue against an area that's a lighter blue or kind of clear looking. And you want to read on the right side of the scale where it looks like a kind of a funky percent symbol there. That's the symbol for salinity. So the area where the dark blue meets the lighter blue is the area you're going to read. That's what it looks like to me. She says 25. That would be 25 parts per thousand, so you can record that on your data sheet. All right? And then what do we always do when we're finished with this? We clean it, right? So uh, we'll go ahead and, and get some um, lens paper out and some of the distilled water and clean this before we put it away.
and I did clean it before we started, so always clean it before and after. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your help. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, using the dissolved oxygen meter to find out how much oxygen is in the water and also what the temperature of the water is. And the reason we did salinity first was not coincidental. Uh, we actually have to input the salinity into this. So I went ahead and did that uh, to get started on this. I turned it on and I let it warm up and then I pressed the two up and down buttons at the same time. Hold those down for a second. That puts it in setup mode. It has a zero and it want, uh, wants to know what you want to set the uh, uh, altitude at. Uh, and so I went ahead and set that. Our altitude here is less than 100 feet. So um, that's uh, why we set it there. And then uh, push the enter button again and it asks for the salinity. And I already put the salinity in as 25 parts per thousand. So it's all set and ready to go. What we're going to do is you have to pull out from the side of the thing the sensor. All right, and this is actually going to go down into the water. And there's a mark on here somewhere uh, that corresponds with one meter. Remember, we try to do all of our measurements at one meter. So I'm going to need two volunteers for this one. Uh, great. All right, both of you come up. You can hold on to this part. And I'll let him put this in the water. So you need to lower this down. There should be a mark. that down into the water and then you're going to move it up and down very quickly and that'll give us an accurate rate of the water moving across the probe. And then we're going to look on here. The top reading is going to be dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter and the bottom one will be temperature in degrees Celsius. Okay? So let me back off here and let you guys do that. Go ahead and lower that down in the water to the one meter mark and then uh, bob it up and down. Seven point three nine milligrams per liter of oxygen and thirty point nine degrees Celsius. All right. So next, we're going to do uh, the pH of the water. So I have a, one of the water samples there, and we have a little portable pH meter. Uh, you guys used pH meters last week in the laboratory, but this is a different kind. This is not a wireless uh, one that connects to the computer. This is a standalone handheld pH probe. Not quite as accurate, but close enough for what we need to do. So with this one, you just uh, push the pH on button, let it come on, and then we're going to stick it in the water, kind of stir it around until the number stabilizes on the display. Right now it's at 6.9. Looks like that's where it's staying. All right, can you see that? 6.9. All right, so you can record that in your data sheets. pH is 6.9. Remember, 7 is neutral pH, so 6.9 is slightly on the acid side. All right, and to turn it off, we hold down the button three seconds and then let go of it and it turns it off and then you want to make sure that you put the cap back on it like so. So the next thing we're going to do is the dissolved carbon dioxide test. Since we did dissolved oxygen that's one common gas that's dissolved in uh, seawater. Another one is carbon dioxide. So typically on a sunny, bright day in the middle of the day, we wouldn't expect to see much carbon dioxide because it's being taken up by algae and uh, seagrasses and plants and phytoplankton to use for photosynthesis. But today it's kind of cloudy and overcast, so we may get some carbon dioxide in the water. So let's go ahead and find out. So we have a little container here. We're going to fill this little glass container up to the 20 milliliter mark with some of the water we collected from our Kimmermeyer water sampler. So I'm going to put 
pour this in here to the 20 milliliter mark. And that's 20 milliliters. And the next thing we're going to do is add a couple of drops of this. This is called phenolphthalein. It's a pH indicator solution. If it turns pink, that means there's no dissolved carbon dioxide. If it doesn't turn pink, we've got another step to do. something white to put this against. Looks pink, right? Slightly. All right, so that means there's no dissolved carbon dioxide. That's the end of the test for us, so you can record a zero as uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide on your data sheet. If it didn't turn pink, there's a second step where we add some other chemical drop by drop, and then we get a measurement of how much uh, carbon dioxide is present. But today it's zero. Once we're done with this, we can just dump this. No thaline is harmless to the fish, so it won't hurt anything. And that's it for that. The next thing we're going to do is the Pharrell Yule color scale. This is a way of measuring the color of the water. You might think color is not important, but it actually tells you quite a bit. It can tell you about the amount of suspended sediment that's in the water. It can tell you about how much rainfall there's been right lately. It can tell you about the weather conditions. It can tell you about how much plankton is in the water. So there's a lot of information you can actually get from the water color. So the way that you do this, inside here are two little comparator scales. Uh, there's colored water basically in these. And then there's two clear glass containers that you stick into this. Um, there's two comparators. One has blues and greens, like this. I don't know if you can see that. And the other one has browns and greens. So we look at the water today, and um, probably closer to the browns and greens today. That's the one we're going to be using. This is probably one of the most difficult things to do because it seems like whenever you look at the water, it actually doesn't match up with any of these. Uh, but um, we just have to give it the best shot that we can. So you take the clear glass containers that contain seawater, you put those in the viewing windows, and then different ways of doing this. Sometimes people use this in com um, together with a secchi disc, but we're just going to use this like this. We kind of hold it out at a distance and we see if we can compare it to the water samples uh, that we see in the little predetermined uh, comparator units there. And as I was saying, it doesn't seem to match any of these. Okay, so we have to pick the closest one. These are in Roman numerals and this water is kind of uh, brownish green doesn't really match any of these mm. not sure that any of these really match let's look at the other one I don't think it matches any of these either doesn't exactly match any of these either, but the closest one is Roman numeral 3. That's I-I-I I, I for your Pharrell color. All right, so the last one we need to do is called fecal coliform test. Coliforms are bacteria that are found in the digestive system. Probably the most famous of these is E. coli. Most people have heard of that. All right, it's supposed to be in your gut. It's not supposed to be in your food. Okay, so you want your bacteria where it's supposed to be, not where it's not supposed to be. Uh, so what we're going to do is check for fecal coliforms in the water. 
How could that get in there? Well, there's a sewage treatment plant. If you want to look over that direction, to, to the left of that on the other side of the bridge, there's a sewage treatment facility. So if they were to get more rain than they could deal with and the ponds overflowed, you could get some uh, sewage that makes its way into the water here. Also, there's houses all along down here. Uh, some of those houses have septic tanks, so those could be leaching into the water. Uh, so there's any number of different things. Uh, some boats have toilets on board and they flush them and it goes into the water. It's not supposed to, it's supposed to go into a tank, but some people do, don't follow the directions. So anyway, there's a variety of ways it could get into the water. And if we get too much of that in the water, obviously it's hazardous to swim or, or be in the water. So um, it would be great if we had an instantaneous test for this, but we don't. Uh, the test actually takes 24 to 48 hours uh, to do. So we're going to collect the sample, we're going to put it in a little tube. This tube contains a growth medium for bacteria and an indicator dye that will change from purple to kind of yellow color if it's a positive test. If it's a negative test, it'll go from purple to clear. Okay, but we have to put it in an incubator and leave it for 24 to 48 hours to do this. So I cannot tell you what the water is like that we're getting in today. I can tell you on Wednesday what the water is like on Monday that we were out in the field. So unfortunately, that's the best we can do. In fact, that's the way the health department uh, does it also, except they'll give you a quantitative test. They'll tell you how many bacteria were in the water. This just tells you whether there's bacteria or not. Right, so it, it can tell you that there aren't any, but it can't tell you how many there are. But you can tell kind of a little bit about how concentrated the bacteria are by how bright yellow it turns. So if it's faint yellow, there's just a few. If it's bright yellow, there's a bunch. Uh, but this is a test that doesn't quantify how much bacteria is in the water. So what we're going to do is we have a sterile eyedropper. We're going to get somebody to uh, go down the ladder here and suck up a little water directly from the from the bay, from the sound here, all right, and then uh, squirt that inside this container. This is sterile, this is sterile, okay, so we're going to put the water in there and then screw the lid on. We'll take this back, put it in the incubator, and I'll let you know the results on Wednesday, okay? So, got somebody to volunteer? I'll do it. All right, all right come on. You're enthusiastic and volunteer for everything, so. All right, I'll hold on to this. You just peel that thing open. Very careful, I don't want you to fall in the water here, but there's a ladder there. The reason we don't do this is with the water from the Kemmermeyer sampler is because that graduated cylinder you're going to cross contaminate from other water sources. So we want to take this water directly from Santa Rosa Sound, which is where we are right now. I'm going to be careful not to touch the end of the tube. Stick it in there. Just squirt the whole thing in there. Great. Good. Put the lid on. Being careful not to touch the top of it. Shake it up. Uh, we got Sharpies in there. We'll write in, uh, information on here about where this was collected and the date. Put it in the incubator and then I'll uh, bring a picture of this to class and let you know what the results are. Okay? That's all we have on our data sheet, so we're done learning how to collect water quality information.